why we are here on earth, and then I want to speak about how we were made for happiness. I want to speak also of how we were called to know, to love, and to serve God. And also I want to speak about the life of discipline in the spiritual life. So let us begin with our questions. Have you ever wondered about your existence? In other words, why are we here? Why do I exist? Why is there something rather than nothing? All of us, at some point or another, have probably asked these questions. Perhaps we've gone to the mountains or to the beach, or maybe we've been sitting by a lake or in a garden. Sometimes these questions may come as a thought when we get out of bed in the morning, or maybe when we're going to sleep at night. We may get lost in thought and begin to wonder, who am I? What am I? Am I just a biological accident? Is the human race just another stage in the process of blind and purposeless evolution? Is this human life just a brief flash of light between the long darkness that preceded the womb and an everlasting darkness that will follow the grave? Am I just a meaningless speck in the universe? Or is there a design or a plan, a plan for my life? Is there any meaning to my life? Where did I come from? Why am I here? All these are questions, very serious questions, that only human beings can ask. For only human beings can engage in any type of serious thinking. I'm not here to answer these questions in a philosophical way. After all, philosophers have been pondering on these questions for thousands of years. And as helpful as philosophy is, we know that it can only take us so far. Human reason can really delve into these questions and take us very far, but in the end, we must take a leap of faith in order to acknowledge the existence of our God. So all of these questions point to one deeper question. Who made us? We know the answer to that. God made us. We exist because God exists. And after we have responded that we exist because God created us, we immediately ask, why did God make us? In other words, why did he have to create us? Since God is a being infinitely perfect, the main reason why he does any, anything must also be an infinitely perfect reason. God, we know, made us to show forth His goodness. The big reason why, why God made the universe and us was to give glory to Himself. We may think, oh, that, so that sounds selfish, right? Well, if this seems to us as if God is egotistical to make things just for His own honor and glory, it is because we can help but think of God in human terms. We think of Him as a creature like ourselves. But when we say that God made the universe and us for His own greater glory, we do not mean to say that God needed any of it, that God needed us nor the universe. God, we know, made us out of love primarily for his own honor and glory. And God has given us the capacity to share with us his everlasting happiness in heaven. Life is the greatest gift that we have. This is why it's so important that we take good care of it. What we eat, how we take care of our body, what images we place in our brains, how much rest we get, etc. All those things are important. 
The principal way in which God's goodness is demonstrated is in the fact that he made us with spiritual and immortal souls capable of sharing his own happiness. Even in human affairs, we feel that the goodness of a person is shown by the generosity with which that person shares himself and his possessions with others. Likewise is the goodness of God shown above all by the fact that he shares his own happiness, he shares himself with us. What the Lord told Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 5, he could also be telling each one of us, and I quote Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. Also, Psalm 139 tells us, and I quote, Lord, you have probed me, you know me, you know when I sit and stand, you understand my thoughts from afar. Even before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it all. Where can I flee from your spirit, from your presence? Where can I flee? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I lie down in the darkness, there you are. If I take wings of dawn and dwell beyond the sea, even there your hand guides me, your right hand holds me fast. You formed my inmost being. You knit me in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am wonderfully made. How precious are your designs, O oh God. If you're ever depressed, if you ever feel lonely, if you ever feel down in life, just go back to this Psalm 139 and you will find great consolation from our Heavenly Father. Letting you know, letting us know that He is not distant, that He is near, that He cares for each one of us that He is there with us when we sit and when we stand, when we lie down and when we wake up in the morning. God is always, always with us. God has created us, and after He created us, He did not abandon us or forgot us. He has an individual, personal love for each human being, and his only desire is to share that happiness with us. It is God's goodness that caused him to share his happiness with us. But what is this happiness that we're talking about? This happiness for which God made us? To answer that, let us begin with an example. The example is that of an American soldier who is stationed at an army base overseas. Let's say that one day the soldier runs across a girl of his dreams online, of all things. Not only is she gorgeous and has all the qualities he is looking for in a woman, but he comes to realize and find out that she is from his hometown. The soldier doesn't know the girl. He has never seen her. He has never heard about her before. But as he looks at her pictures, the soldier says to himself, Gee, I like how this girl looks. This is the woman that I like to marry. And the boy and the girl begin a regular correspondence. They exchange pictures. They begin to tell one another all about themselves. Every day the soldier grows more and more in love with this girl he has never seen. Then finally the soldier is shipped home. For two years he has been thinking about this girl. He has been in love with this girl from afar. And because of his love for her, he has been a better soldier and has become a better man. He has tried to be the sort of fellow that the girl would want him to be. He has done the things she would like him to do and has kept from doing anything that would displease her if she knew about it. 
It is actually a hunger for the girl that he has had in his heart. And now he is coming home. Now, can you imagine the happiness that will tingle in every fiber of that boy's being as he steps off the plane and at long, at long last takes his girl into his arms? Oh, he exclaims as they embrace, oh, if only this moment could last forever. Have you ever had a moment like that? A moment when you say to yourself, oh my gosh, this is so awesome, so beautiful, so deep, so unbelievable. I wish that this moment could last forever. The happiness of the soldier is the happiness of love fulfilled. Love finding itself at last in complete possession of the person loved. The boy will always look back at this moment just like we look back at moments that we've had like that in our lives. He may look back at this moment as one of the happiest moments of his life on earth. Obviously all examples fail and are imperfect, but if we can imagine such scene and you tell me that you've all had moments like that, then we can only begin to imagine the happiness of encountering real love one day when we get to heaven. For the primary happiness of heaven exists exactly in this, that we shall possess the infinitely perfect God and be possessed by Him in a union so utterly complete that we cannot know, even faintly imagine, the ecstasy of it. It will not be a human being, however wonderful, that we will possess. It will be God Himself that we will possess, that we will be united to forever. God who is infinite goodness and truth and beauty. God who is everything. God who is infinite love as no human love possibly can will fulfill every craving and desire of the human heart. We shall then know an incredible happiness such as eye has not seen nor ear has heard nor has it entered into the hearts of men, as St. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. And it is a happiness which, once achieved, we can never lose. All of us are looking for happiness, are we not? Right? Deep down, we have been wired for it, right? All of us desire to be happy. There is an innate desire within each of us to live an authentic life. We have a universal hunger for the authentic, a longing to be and become and experience all we are capable of and created for. Every person yearns for happiness like the desert yearns for rain. Of course, no one is perfectly happy in this life. Sometimes people think that they will be perfectly happy if they can get everything they want. But what happens when they finally get it? What happens? They want more. We always want more. That's what happens. When we get it, whether it's health or wealth or fame, or a loving family, or loyal friends, whatever it may be, in the end, we find that there's still something missing. We still aren't genuinely happy. There's still something that our heart hungers for. Oftentimes, we confuse pleasure for happiness, but they are two different things. Worldly goods, pleasure, possessions, Power. All those things can cause a temporary happiness, but in reality they are only a shadow of the authentic happiness. A person's shadow is real, right? 
but it is nothing compared to the actual person. And so many of us spend a large portion of our lives chasing shadows. Too often, worldly goods are like salt water to a thirsty man, increasing instead of satisfying the craving that we have for happiness. St. Augustine is the one that used to say that he looked for God in earthly things, and yet the more he did so, it was like drinking salt water, the thirstier he would get. Happiness in this life is never perfect. It's never complete. We get glimpses of the happiness of heaven, you know, here and there. In those moments that we say, we wish they could last forever. They really are only little glimpses of what happiness in heaven will be like. And it is right here in the fact that no human ever is perfectly happy in this life, that we have one of our greatest proofs for the existence of everlasting happiness beyond the grave. God, who is infinitely good, would not place in human hearts this desire for perfect happiness if there were no way in which that desire could be satisfied. Does that make sense to you? So God, the one who placed that desire, He placed it there so that He could fulfill it. God does not torture with frustration the souls whom He has made. Even if the material or spiritual riches of this life could satisfy every human want, and we know that they can't, but let's pretend for a minute that they could, even then there would still be the knowledge that one day, death would take it all from us, and our happiness would be incomplete. Just thinking about that. In heaven, on the contrary, not only shall we be happy to the utmost capacity of our hearts, but we also shall have that final perfect happiness of knowing that nothing and no one can ever take that joy away from us. It is eternally secure. God sent His only Son to respond to humanity's yearning for happiness and to teach us how to satisfy that yearning. Love is our origin and our destiny. Our yearning for happiness is a yearning for love. We were created by our parents out of love. God fashioned each soul out of love. Love is our origin and our destiny. We were created to love and to be loved. Our yearning for happiness, therefore, is ultimately a yearning for God that will only be satisfied fully when we reach eternity. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states, and I quote, The desire for God is written in the human heart because humans are created by God and for God. And God never ceases to draw man to himself. Only in God will man find the truth and happiness he never stops yearning for. God is always at work in the world, and particularly in our souls. Are you with me so far? Let me take a little sip of water while you digest all this information. So that desire written in human hearts God is always at work in the world, always at work. And every single day, every single day, there are a million, a million ways at least in which God is reaching out to us. He wants to let us know how much He loves us, sometimes in very simple, very simple things, but He's always at work. You've also heard it said, right, that the devil's always at work. Mm -hmm. 
right? And that is true, the devil's always at work, but if the devil works, God works overtime. <laughs> so we can rest assured that if the devil is always at work, God is always at work even more. Then in the end, you know, God, we know, wins. Our desire for happiness is not going to go away. It is part of the human condition. Our quest for happiness is a quest for God. This yearning for joy is designed to draw us gently toward our eternal home. Our yearning for eternal bliss is a yearning for union with our Creator. As St. Augustine used to say, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O Lord. So what does the happiness of heaven consist of? Essentially, it's the vision of God, the final and complete possession of the God whom we have desired and loved weakly at a distance. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, At present we see indistinctly as in a mirror, but then face to face. At present I know partially. Then I shall know fully as I am fully known. And if that is to be our destiny, to be eternally united with God in love, then it follows that we must begin to love God here in this life. God cannot fulfill something that does not even exist. If there is no beginning of love for God in our hearts here upon earth in the here and now, then there can be no fruition of love in eternity. We now have come full circle to answer the question that you are all here for tonight. What is then the purpose of our existence? Why has God placed us here upon earth? The answer is very simple. He has created us so that by loving Him, we may lay the necessary foundation for the happiness of heaven. Let me say that again. God has created us. He has placed us here on earth so that by loving Him, and one another, of course, loving God is loving each other, we may lay the necessary foundation for the happiness of heaven. So heaven needs a foundation. We lay that foundation here. That's why we were created. We spoke about a soldier who, at a distant post, you know, sees this girl's picture in the internet, falls in love with her, he begins corresponding with this girl and then ends up by having her for his very own when he eventually returns home. It's kind of like a happy ending, you know, a story with a happy ending, right? They get married and they live happily ever, last, ever, you know, ever after. But it is evident that if the boy had not been impressed by the girl's picture in the first place, or if he had lost interest after the exchange and had stopped writing, it is evident that the girl would have meant nothing to the boy when he got back home. Even if she happened to be at the airport when his plane landed, she would be just another face in the crowd to him. His heart would not jump at the sight of her. Similarly, unless we begin to love God in this life, there is no way in which we can be united with God in eternity. For one who would go into eternity with no love for God in his heart, heaven would simply not exist. Just as a man without eyes cannot see the beauty of the world around him, so the man without love for God cannot see God. He goes into eternity blind. It's not a case of God saying to the unrepentant sinner, Sin, you know, being, of course, a denial of God's love. You know, God simply saying, you do not love me, I want no part of you, go to hell. It's not about that. It's the man who dies without love for God, without repenting of his sins. It's the man himself who has made that choice, not God. 
God is there, but he cannot see him. Just as the sun still shines, though the blind man cannot see it. All of our choices, then, are ultimately aimed at getting happiness. But we can choose right or wrong ways of gaining it. Good choices offer a lasting, deeper happiness, but only one thing is better than lasting happiness, and that is everlasting happiness. Could it then be that the happiness we experience in this world is not the main event, but merely a foretaste of something more? We are creatures made for another world. This is not our temper this is not our home our permanent home this is our temporary home this is why we always long for so much more than what this world can offer us thus we have answered the first purpose of our existence the first purpose of our existence then is to love god to love God so that we can be happy in the here and now and then in all of eternity. Why else were we created? Is that the only reason why? I think not. It is evident that we cannot love someone that we do not know. That brings us to our second duty, another duty which we have in this life. We must learn all that we can about God so that we may love him and keep our love for him alive so that our love for him can grow every day let's go back to our imaginary soldier yet again if the boy had never seen the girl's picture he certainly would have never loved her he could not love someone he had never heard of even after seeing the picture and being impressed with the girl's appearance if the boy had not taken the initiative to write and found out through correspondence what kind of a person she was, his first impulse of interest would never have developed into ardent love. So, to love God, we also must know about God. We must get to know God. This is why we come here this evening, right, I hope, <laughs> to learn more about God so that we can love him more, so that we can fall in love with him more. This is why we have catechism lessons and religious religion courses in school. This is why we come to Mass every Sunday. This is why we read Catholic books and periodicals. But intellectual knowledge of God is only a step in the right direction. I mean, we could have a master's in theology or even a doctorate in theology and know a lot about God and yet our hearts could still be very far from him all of our efforts to get to know him better should lead us to develop a deep love for him this love grows and develops over time it's never static the primary way to get to know God is through prayer both communal prayer and individual prayer. As Blessed Mother Teresa said in the excerpt that we reflected on at the very beginning of our talk, she said, how can we last even one day without hearing Jesus say, I love you? Impossible. Our soul needs that as much as the body needs to breathe the air. So the more that we love God, the more that we'll want to know Him and vice versa. So our knowledge of God is meant to love Him more. And after we love Him and after we get to know Him and we persevere in this, what then is the next step? There's still more. <laughs> the next step is we must prove our love for Him. There is, of course, only one way of proving our love for anyone. That is by doing the things that will please the one we love, by doing what the loved person wants us to do. Taking once more the example of our soldier boy, 
If while claiming to love this girl and wanting to marry her, he at the same time spent his time and money on prostitutes and drunkenness, he would be a liar, wouldn't he? It would not be real love at all, else he would try to be the kind of man that his girl wants him to be. Likewise, there is only one way in which we can prove our love for God, and that is by doing what God wants us to do, by being the kind of human beings He wants us to be. Love for God does not reside in the emotions. We've been talking a lot about love for God, right? And we may be, you know, mistakenly led to think that love for God may mean, you know, getting butterflies in our stomach, you know, or getting goosebumps, you know, all the time, you know, whenever we think of Him. Well, you know, sometimes we do experience God love in that way. Perhaps at a retreat, you know, maybe at prayer, maybe in the silence of our hearts, maybe when we come to Eucharistic adoration. Yes, you know, we might sometimes, but it's got to go above and beyond that. Sometimes we do feel God's love in an emotional way, but that is not at all essential. Love goes beyond the emotions. If not, just ask married couples, right? Love grows and develops. How many married couples do we have here? Raise your hand who's been married more than 25 years. We have more than a few, you know, have been married for a long time. Do you feel the same thing, you know, now as you did, you know, when you first saw the person that you married? You know, when you were dating? You know, I mean, love develops, right? I mean, it grows, it's never static. Yes, you know, there is there, and that's the foundation, but it's not necessarily in the same way. Otherwise, you know, we stay at a very shallow level of love. Love goes beyond the emotions, for it resides in the will. We will to love, and that will, that desire to love, is love itself. It is not in how we feel toward God, but in what we are willing to do for God that our love for Him proves itself. I mean, otherwise, what would happen, right? You feel God's love, you go on retreat, you know, you feel His, uh, His great, you know, depth of His love in your heart, and then once you don't feel it, then that's it, you know, you pretend, okay, well, God doesn't love me, or I don't love Him anymore. Well, you know, it's not about that. We have to prove our love for Him, and love goes beyond the emotions. The more that we do for God here, the greater will be our happiness in heaven. As our love for God increases and develops, and as our obedience to His will also increases, so also does our capacity for happiness in God increase. While it is true that every soul in heaven will be perfectly happy, it is also true that some will have a greater capacity for happiness than others. The great saints, obviously, you know, will have a greater capacity than us poor lowly souls. But imagine, it's like six people listening to a symphony concert, each with a different back background, each happily absorbed in the music. But there will be six different grades of enjoyment, depending upon the musical knowledge and musical appreciation that each person has. Therefore, the answer to the question, why did God create us? The traditional answer of the Baltimore Catechism still holds. And we know the answer. God made us so that we could know him. love Him, know Him, and serve Him. And I would say in that order, in the order that I have explained, to love Him, to fall in love with Him, to know Him, so as we love Him, we want to know more about Him, and that increases our love and vice versa, so that then we can serve Him in this life to be happy in the next. So, we love God because He is our Father. He gave us life. He is our everything. 
We get to know God when we study our faith, when we read the Bible, and especially when we pray. That's how we get to know God. As we know more about God and as we know Him more, we fall in love with Him even more. And as we fall in love with Him more, we want to please Him and demonstrate our love for Him by serving others. There is no true love unless love is manifested in action. It is in the doing of what the loved one wants that we show God how much we love Him. Just tonight, a professor of mine sent me a beautiful reflection about two defining tragedies of our society. And this is what he said. He says, the first one is, we fear looking at each other in the face. We fear looking at each other in the face. I mean, when you go to the stores, have you noticed that you know, people don't look at you in the eyes anymore, hardly ever, do they? Yeah, eye contact is lacking, you know, big time now. So he says, that's one, you know, one tragedy of our society. The second one, he says, we fear loving. We fear loving others because it leaves us open to the worst pain that there is. Unreciprocated love. When we love, we become vulnerable. When we love others, we know that there's always that risk that the other one may not love me back. And so my professor says, so what do we do, he says, we turn to our smartphones. <laughs> they may be smart, but they are dead. They're not a human being. We may be looking at our smartphones in the eyes, but they're not looking back at us in the eye. We can look at them directly without feeling insecure and vulnerable. Perhaps that's why we... Um, we turn to them. They cannot threaten us with their love. You know, we are safe. Looking at our smartphones, it's something that we can control. True love is shown by how we end up treating each other, particularly the poor, the marginalized, the migrant, the voiceless. We cannot bear to love them at times because we know that it's too risky. We incarcerate them than in the dungeons of our minds under the rubrics of illegal or unproductive and other labels of our own making. Crucified love hurts, so it's more pleasant not to love. Crucified love is madness, as St. Paul says, so it's more rational to despise love. Rejection, hatred, racism seem to be safer they seem to be more rational. Rational. They seem to be alternatives to love. We reject the face of the other. We reject the summons to love to a risky, vulnerable, Pascal love. But when we do so, we are not fulfilling one of the purposes for which we were created and our lives wind up empty and dry. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has said, that nowadays there's a globalization of indifference that has robbed us our capacity to weep for the others. Yes, the bothersome face of love, the face of Jesus Christ unveiling itself today in all the crucified victims of our society continues to disturb us, to provoke us, to unsettle us. But this is the face that we cannot turn away from if we want our lives to find meaning. Fulfillment is not found by turning to our smartphones, but in the giving of ourselves to serve others. It is important to remember that God does not leave us to our human weakness in this matter. So we may say, oh my gosh, I mean, this is, how am I going to do this? to love God, to know Him, to serve Him. I mean, this is a great task. It's a huge task, and it is. But He doesn't leave us alone in this endeavor. His grace is always near. Even the smallest impulse that we have to pray just a little bit and get closer to God 
are God's initiative. We simply respond to them, or not. Heaven is a supernatural reward to be achieved through the living of a supernatural life. Now we're going to move into the third part of our talk, but I need a little water. <laughs> so think about what we're talking about. And so we've been talking about, you know, loving God, we've been talking about knowing God, we've been talking about serving God. How do we do that? How do we increase our knowledge and our love for Him so that we can serve Him? It requires a life of discipline and discipleship. You thought it was going to be easy, right? <laughs> There's no way around it. There's no shortcut. There is no easy way. Even if we have been coming to church since we were born, we must guard at all times until the moment of our death that we don't become lukewarm and that's why we need a life of training to continue in love with the Lord. In the Gospel, Jesus says, Whoever wishes to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Through his life, notice that Jesus never asked, What is the least that I can do to bring salvation to humanity? Right? He never said that. He asked, on the other hand, What is the most that I can do? For this is the question of a lover. What is the most that I can do? That's what a lover asks. The lifestyle that Jesus invites us to take is contrary to the world, which has all the isms, right? The world you know, has all the isms. Individualism, hedonism, minimalism, relativism, materialism. The world encourages us to do whatever we want, whenever we want, whatever we want. Jesus, on the other hand, invites us to a life of discipleship, and this requires discipline. We know about discipline. Intellectually, we do, right? When we eat well, when we exercise often, when we sleep regularly, we know that we feel more energy, we feel more fully, we feel we're more fully alive physically. We know that when we give priority to our spouses and our children, and when we help others, we feel more fully alive emotionally. We know that when we study well and read books, we know that our world expands and we feel more fully alive intellectually. When we take a few moments each day, when we spend some time in silence and come to God in prayer, we know that we experience life more fully spiritually. All of these life-giving endeavors don't happen by sitting on a couch and watching TV. That's for sure. They all require discipline. We are most fully alive when we embrace a life of discipline. After all, the human person thrives on discipline, right? I mean, I see that in the school all the time. You know, children thrive on discipline. They need the discipline. You know, many times, you know, the children are not getting that at home, but they do get that in school. And then the parents you know, complain and they say, well, I don't understand why he or she behaves so well in school. He doesn't behave that well at home. And at times it's because discipline is lacking. We are most fully alive when we embrace a life of discipline. We thrive on it. And so the question for us is, are we thriving or are we just surviving? Is something missing in your life? Do we not feel fully alive? Is there a heaviness in your heart? If you answer yes to any of the above questions, then perhaps you need to embrace a life of discipline and discipleship. And we know how it goes, right? We make resolutions. January 1st comes around, right? We make all these resolutions, we make this long list, you know, sometimes it's in our head, you know, but we're like, this year, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And we do, for a day or two, 
<laughs> for a week or two. But then what happens? As the weeks go by and as the months go by, we don't embrace the discipline that a resolution requires. Discipline awakens us. It refines us. It sets us free. It sharpens our senses. Many people don't embark in a spiritual journey of growth because of the discipline that it entails. But Jesus proposes a life of discipline not as an end in itself, but as a means to an end, as a means to achieve the freedom that he wants to give us. The Lord wants us to be free from our whims, our cravings, our addictions, and our attachments. He wants to free us from sin. For freedom is not doing whatever we want. Freedom is the strength of character to do what is good, what is true, what is noble, what is right. Strength of character is not stumbled upon in life's moments of, of need and temptation. Character is built little by little, over days, weeks, months, and years, with thousands of small acts of discipline. We can only get to know, to love, and to serve God if we embrace this lifestyle wholeheartedly. Beware of anyone wanting to give you quick fixes or pretending that Christianity does not come with a cost. Retreats are great, but they're only a starting point. Perseverance is the key. When we persevere in a life of discipline, we experience joy, peace, and above all, freedom. The freedom that is beyond our imagination. A freedom that can begin in this life and that will take us to life everlasting. So to conclude, the fall of creation and each one of us were made for the glory of God, not to increase his glory, for that would be impossible, but to show it forth and to communicate it. As St. Bonaventure would poetically say, and I quote, creatures came into existence when love opened his hand. How beautiful, right? We came into existence when love opened his hand and we can substitute love for God and God for love for we know that God is love. And so we are here on earth because God has loved us. He created us out of love for his own honor and glory so that he could share his love with us in this life and then in life everlasting. We were created for happiness, for joy, and we know that only in God do we find authentic truth, beauty, goodness, joy, that happiness that deep down our souls are searching for. Our desire for God is written in our hearts, and it's not going to go away. The purpose of our existence is to love God, in loving Him, we thirst for Him and want to get to know Him. But we cannot stop there. We must also demonstrate our love for Him by serving Him. None of this comes easily as it requires a life of discipline and discipleship so that we can persevere in His love and service. But don't be afraid. God does not abandon us. He's always near, helping us in this journey. For it was He, the one who placed that desire in our hearts to begin with. Therefore, listen daily to the words of Jesus in your soul telling you, I love you. And let's reciprocate that love by the way that we behave. Amen. Amen. The talk would not be complete unless I had announcements. So I have a couple of announcements before I open it up for questions, because then, you know, after the questions begin, you know, then it may, it may get um, a little, you know, uh, you may lose your focus. So, two things I want to announce, well, three things I want to announce. One is this Sunday is our parish picnic. So the parish picnic begins after the 10.30 mass here in the hall and outside, so please come to the picnic and enjoy yourselves. 
Uh, number two is uh, uh, there is a new ministry that we just opened at Blessed Trinity. It's called our Outreach Ministry. Uh, we've been talking you know, today about knowing God, loving God, and serving Him. And, you know, I mean, this is wonderful, you know, and I thank you for coming tonight, uh, for, th for coming in great numbers. But uh, you know how it is, you know, at times, you know, after, after homily, after mass, and people come back, oh, Father, wonderful homily, you know, wonderful homily. It's like, okay, well, that's nice, but what are we doing about it? Okay, how's that going to change me, all right? That, that's, you know, the greatest compliment you can pay is not so much to say, you know, that was a great message, but it's how we change our hearts, how the message touches my heart, how Jesus, not me uh, personally, you know, but how Jesus, the Holy Spirit, touches our hearts and transforms our hearts. And so we're doing okay, I think, you know, we have begun after, you know, 15 months, you know, we've been here of, of getting to know the faith a little deeper, uh, getting to know God a little more, you know, loving Him, but there's one leg that's missing, that's like, what are we doing to help the poor? And with the parish council, I mean, it's been something that's been coming up, and so I, I've been thinking, you know, praying about it, and, and one thing that I, that I told them was, this is not going to happen as if by magic. I said it could only happen if, if there is uh, a couple or uh, you know one person who will lead a new ministry. And so I tapped into a couple, Lino and Jenny, who are here tonight. I want you to stand to be acknowledged. <laughs> They, they were looking, you know, to serve God, you know, more, and they had their own ideas on how to do that. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, one day I was talking to Jenny after Mass, uh, they come to the 1230 Mass, you know, faithfully, and, and she said to me, you know, Father, I want to get more involved, and, and you know, like, kind of stay with me, kind of stay with me, and as I was praying about it, you know, their names kept coming back, you know, to me, and so I, I, I uh, gathered them, you know, for a meeting, and, and we got together, and I asked them, and of course, you know, they were a little surprised, but very happy, you know, to do that. that their response, I think, is, is typical of a disciple. They, they said, Father, this is not what we had in mind. <laughs> you know, we thought of maybe being university ministers, you know, lecturing. They said, you know, but, you know, if God is calling, we're not going to say no. You know, if God is calling, we're going to say yes. So what we hope to accomplish this year to start, you know, maybe later on we'll do more, but what we hope to accomplish this year is to have three drives for the poor. You know, maybe one for Camilla's house, uh, they need canned goods, you know, I got a letter, you know, requesting that. So that may be one drive for Thanksgiving. We're going to have another drive for Christmas, maybe uh, either toys or clothes for children. And we're going to send them to a sister who's doing a wonderful mission in Colombia. In, in a uh, territory that was plagued by, by guerrilla, you know, warfare, and, and so on. And then we may have another one, uh, local also, uh, maybe for homestead or, or something like that. Uh, that. That'll be for land. So again, you know, thank you, and I uh, you know that they'll count on the support you know, of everyone, the whole parish. The last thing that I have is, remember I've been talking about a surprise, right? About a surprise. I hope it's a pleasant surprise. Well. Guess what? The surprise arrived early. I was hoping for the surprise to come on the weekend of our consecration, but God had other plans, and you know, God has his plans, and that's fine. The, the surprise is coming the weekend before, so the 27th and the 28th of October, which is not this weekend, but next weekend, so it's around the corner. September. September, September sorry, September. So yeah, because it's October, you know, October 5th and 6th, so that's why I had it told. So it's September 27th and 28th, so not this weekend, next weekend, the surprise is arriving. And the surprise is we're going to have the blessing of having the first class relic, the blood of John Paul II, once again at Blessed Trinity. Wow. So it's, it's a great, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, as you know, I know you, you have all been. You told me that you have been following this book, right? Yes. And what's great about that, and this is God's providence, you know, what I thought, is just when we are getting the relic, the relic is coming, it's the week when this uh, booklet will begin to prepare us in the thought and in the love that John Paul II had for the Blessed Mother. So this is how it's going to work. Um, the, we're going to have um, the relic 
after at the mass at the 6:30 vigil mass in Spanish on Saturday night. It will be followed uh, by a recitation of the rosary, a talk, and then a veneration of the relic. You know, private veneration of the relic. You know, one by one. Then the next day, Sunday, at the 5:30 mass, you know, we'll have the relic again, and then you know, same thing. We'll do a rosary after mass. We'll have a little talk, and then we're going to have you know the public veneration of the relic. You know, and you can go privately also and venerate the relic. So it's a, it's a great way to continue to prepare for our weekend of consecration, just in time for the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. So I think that's all I have. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions. Maybe uh, we can. We have a few minutes. It's 8:35. Maybe we can go to 8:45, and then. Uh, Call it a night. How does that sound? Okay, any questions? Any reflections? Anything? I don't know if you want to maybe come up and so. I'll, I'll or, try to speak to okay. I, my family experienced two losses last year, people very dear to us. And you speak about getting to How does purgatory play a role in separating us from that particular goal? And really, what happens to us when we die? What, well, very good question. Thank you. What happened to us? What happens to us when, when we die? And what role does purgatory you know, play in this? And, you know what? This microphone just to shut off. So, anyway, you can hear me, right? Well. Purgatory would be, you know, we're talking about heaven, and heaven would be perfect love. So purgatory would be the place for imperfect love. You know, we know we have, we have sins, we know we have failings, you know, we know we have imperfections. So when we do die, you know, the, uh, our, our goal should be, you know, to go straight to heaven. But we know that sometimes, you know, that's not possible, that that, that may not happen. That love, our love is imperfect, that we didn't love you know, enough, that we didn't serve you know, others enough, that we didn't pray you know, enough, that we failed. But we know also that we made our choice in life you know, and that we wanted you know, to be faithful to the Lord. And so uh, when that happens, when our love is imperfect, then you know, we go through a purgation. You know, so more than a place, you know, I, I want us to move away from those categories. You know, we think of heaven, hell, purgatory as places. You know, they're more states of being more than anything else. You know, there we get purified to be able to behold God face to face, you know, in heaven. Anybody else? Any reaction? Any? All right, well, you know, the choir's here, so I'm going to ask him to maybe... Finish with a song. <laughs> yes. So, uh, Sal. And then that will be our closing prayer. They rehearsed early today so they could come to the talk. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here.
Let us end with the glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And may Almighty God bless all of you and your families, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good night. Go in peace. Thanks for coming.